Hello, and welcome back to Try Your Hand. I'm Brenda, and today we will be making a book nook. So why don't we get started with the supplies? So in your kit for this project, you will have these supplies. You'll have some air dry clay, some cardstock, some tracing paper, a box, moss, a small piece of cloth, quite a few coffee stirrers, some popsicle sticks, a bag of tiny leaves, two small boulders, three paint brushes, one that's this size, one that's bigger, and one that's smaller. You'll have a LED light pack and two styrofoam blocks. So you will have a foam sheet, cardboard or chipboard, some floral wire. You will also have some pebbles. So these are things that are not in your kit that you will need. So you'll need some wire cutters, you'll need pliers, and you'll need um, an X-Acto knife or a craft scissors. You'll also need some pencils. The first thing that we want to do is to get our box ready. So in order to do this, I have labeled each section of the box with letters so that it's easier for me to explain exactly which sections are the ones that are going to go together because we are going to be making this box a little differently than it was manufactured to be folded into. So as you can see, this box was made to be horizontal, so like the long side is on the bottom. But because we're going to be making a book nook, we want this box to be open on the long edge, that long skinny side. That way it looks like a book. So we will have to cut this box in a specific way before we can start putting it together. So as you can see, I am cutting out the F section. So I am taking off the two flaps on the side. So then I will be cutting off um, section B from section F and section J from section F. Once we have freed section F from the rest of the box, we will set that off to the side. This portion will be important for later, so you don't want to throw it away, just set it off to the side. Then I will show you how to start to glue this box together. So just to make it easier for you to see, I'm putting the box back to how it looked like, but with that F section missing. I'm going to be then gluing section I to section J, because that's exactly where that section would be if section F was still where it was supposed to be. So when you're gluing these sections together, you will need to use some sort of glue, of course. I used hot glue simply because that was a fast like drying or curing glue, but you can use like a regular white glue or any other type of adhesive to secure this box together. If you use white glue, it will just take a little bit longer for it to dry and you might want to put some weights on the sections that you glued down just so that it stays secure. On the other side, I will be doing the same thing. So I will be gluing section I to section J and then section M and G and E and K. When you're gluing E and K and M and G together, don't fully glue it. Make sure that it's kind of tacked on on the long edges of those sides because these flaps on section A will be going in between those two cardboard sections and that is needed for something later in our project. So now this is what your box should be looking like. You have flap C and D still up. If this was a normal box, you would fold it back down. But because we cut out section F, we need to secure sections C and D to section B so that the box is fully formed. 
And then of course the flaps on section A, as you can see, will be inserted into those pockets that I was talking about before. Section F is then now the window into our book nook. Now, you may be wondering why we even need section A in the first place. And the reason for that is because we need that flap in order to access the back of our book nook. For the book nook, we are going to be making a section that kind of glows with light. So we have given you a little LED pack and this back flap is where we'll be able to access that LED like battery pack in order to change the batteries and also turn on the lights. So now we, we can get started on the background. So we're going to take that uh, section F that we put to the side. We're going to use that as our background insert. So it will be about maybe a quarter of an inch in from the back because of the whole LED light pack situation. But first, in order to be able to get it to fit inside of our box correctly, we will have to trim the top a little bit. I took off about a half inch and that made it so that it fit quite well. So as you can see here, we have that background and it's a little bit away from the actual back of our project, which is where we're going to put our battery pack. So for my background, what I want it to be is a night scene. So I want there to be a cutout for the moon, the sky, and a couple of hills with a little stream running down. So that is what I'm going to start to paint my background as. So the first thing that I did here was to mark out where my moon was going to be. My moon, I decided, was going to be in the upper left hand corner of my background here, and I marked that off. You do not need a compass for this part. You can take a cup or something that's the right circumference or you can just draw your moon however you want. So I then marked that off and when I did so, I took an X-Acto knife and started to cut out in that line. So I started by using a sawing motion in the cardboard to take out that circle. Of course, this is a knife, so be careful with that. So you only have a few paints, which means that you're going to have to mix your own colors. But luckily, I can walk you through some of this. So I wanted a kind of navy blue, dark blue color for my sky. So I took a little bit of blue and a little bit of black and started mixing them. I first realized that I think I put a little bit too much black into my mixture and then I just took a little bit more blue and mixed that in and then I just started painting the entire cardboard surface. You don't really have to cover it all, uh, just about maybe like a third of the way down, more or less, because if you're going to do hills like I did, really the hills are going to cover up the rest of it. So another thing I did was I kind of made a little bit more texture in the sky by using different mixtures of black and blue. So for example, I ran out of the original color that I mixed up and so then I mixed up some more but it isn't quite exactly the same color and that's fine. I just kind of dry brushed it on top of the original layer that I did. And it ended up looking kind of cool. It kind of gave a bit of a different texture and made the sky look a little swirly. So my next thing was to make the hills. So I decided on three different hills at different heights. So I measured out my original cardboard piece and then with a pencil on my foam sheets, that's what we're using for these hills, I kind of just marked a rounded shape at the top. I wanted the rounded shape to be a little bit offset so that the highest point of that hill isn't right in the middle. I kind of just eyeballed it essentially. 
what I tried to do was to make sure that the hill wasn't covering my little cutout for the moon. So I just made sure that I knew the measurement of where the moon was just so that I didn't make my hill too tall. And of course, you can always trim your hill if you realize that you made it a little too tall or not the right shape that you wanted. So you can just cut out your piece and then we will start to paint it. So after I have my hill cut out, I started to mix up the color of my hills. So in order to make green, you would mix the yellow and the blue together. I also want to make a slightly darker green, so I would add like a teeny bit of black and mix that in. If you want a more yellow green, you would add more yellow. If you want a more blue green, like a teal type color, you would add more blue. So get the color that you like and then you can start painting your hill. One thing I will mention is that this white foam doesn't absorb the paint as well. So you will have to do a couple of coats of this green color in order for you to be able to cover the foam correctly. So when I covered my hill with the green that I mixed up, I took off any of the excess paint with my brush. I did these long up and down strokes to take off any of that excess. What that does is it gives the hill a cool texture. It kind of makes it almost look like grass. So taking another piece of foam, I decided to cut out another section of hill. This hill is actually a little bit more offset than the previous one, and then I cut that out. And then of course I did the exact same thing I did with the previous hill. I did make sure that it fit right with my previous hill. After I made sure that looked good, I continued painting that. And then of course I did the same thing again in order to make the third hill. So now that we're done painting and we did our secondary coat of paint on all of our little mountains, what we're going to do is glue the hills onto our background. So I remembered which ones were supposed to be like on the bottom and which ones were supposed to be on top. I put some glue down and then I layered them. But before I glued it, I decided where I wanted my little stream to go. So I took some white paint and I painted on where my streams were going to go. So I wanted it to go in a sort of zigzag pattern. So I was kind of seeing where my stream would go. As a reminder, the mountain in the back, right, is the furthest out. So the stream has to be smaller on that hill at a medium width on the middle hill and then a little larger than that on the last hill. If you feel as if one section of your uh, hill is too long, again, you can trim it. But also, if you feel as if there are some sections that are like flopping over, you can glue another little piece of foam to support that little section that you feel is, is leaning back towards the other mountains. So once everything is now glued down, I then needed to paint the stream. I did paint the background, this white background, uh, so that the green wouldn't show through. But, you know, streams aren't white, they're blue. So I took a little bit of white and a little bit of blue just to kind of lighten that color. And with my thin brush, I kind of made little small strokes on the white to kind of make like little waves as if the water's like moving. 
I also use different like shades of blue so I took you know blue with no white and I put that down and maybe a little bit of a darker blue and put that down as well and a little bit of black as well just to give the stream a little bit more depth and to make it look like the like that white that does show through a little bit is like the light of the moon making the water sparkle. Now that you have glued down your mountains, what you want to do is add some detail to your hills. So right here, what I'm doing is just covering up some extra spaces that I thought were a little too white. I'm doing like a third coat on the hills and then painting the edges. If you want your hills to be a little grassy, what I did was I took some red and yellow and made like an orangey color. I put a little bit of black in there to make it look a little bit more brown. And then with your thin brush, you want to just make little thin lines up and down on your hills. That way you're mimicking grass. I also put in a whole bunch of different colors. So I put in a little bit of yellow, a little bit of red, a little bit of darker green, a little bit of lighter green, just to kind of give the grass a little bit more dimension and make it look a little bit more realistic. If you want to make little trees or bushes, I used a little bit of brown and with my thin brush, I kind of made little tree trunks all around where I wanted my trees to be. And then I mixed up a dark green and then I made my leaves. When I finished with that, I took a little bit of white with that or a little bit of yellow and made up different shades of green and kind of laid that on top, making some highlights in my trees. So for this last hill, this hill is going to be the one that's going to be covered with the tree. So I'm not going to make that much of a big uh, deal with this hill. So I just took different shades of green that I mixed up and then kind of just splashed it areas just to give the hill a little bit more of those highlights and stuff and then I kind of just painted around my creek a little bit and then kind of left the rest of the hill because it's going to be covered anyway. So the next thing that you want to do is to make details in the sky. So I made a few little stars. I took some white paint with my thin brush and put a few little white dots all over the sky. Then if I wanted to make slightly bigger stars I made this like T shape and then a little X in between that little T shape. So once we're finished with our details we can then set this off to the side. So for this next part um, we are then going to have to glue on our tracing paper to make like this diffusing layer over the moon to make it look more like a moon. So I'm going to take my tracing paper, I'm going to fold it in half, and then I'm going to cut it to shape. I did not cut it into a circle, I just kind of cut it into a square a little bit bigger than the circle itself. So I just kind of eyeballed it and cut it. Once I've cut it, I will then put some Elmer's glue down around the circle and then glue down my tracing paper. I then also put glue in between the different layers of tracing paper just to make sure that both of them are stuck on there. Then you can set that off to the side and let it dry. So 
Okay, so for the walls, we do need to cut them out. You either should have a template for the side walls or you have like an extra box and you can just cut off the sides off of that extra box. We will have to trim it later, but again, that's gonna be later. So the first thing that we do is prime our walls with white paint. This is only if you want a more vibrant color. If you want a darker color or you don't care if the brown comes through, then you can just leave it and paint it your color. So once you're done priming, you can then decide what color you want your walls to be. I decided to make my walls kind of like a darkish navyish blue color. So I mixed up that color until I liked it and then I started painting it with my big brush. You will have to do a couple of coats of this color in order for the white to not be visible. Once you have finished your second coat, what we're going to do is then decide how we're going to decorate our walls. I decided on white stripes, so I kind of just eyeballed it, to be honest, and took my small square brush and just very carefully drew white lines down with the paint. Then I took my small thin paintbrush and went over it a few times until the white was opaque enough for me. If I messed up, if I kind of went a little bit too thick on the paint, I did go back in with that blue and kind of covered up those sections where I messed up. I did the same thing with both walls. So when you're done painting the walls, you can set those off to the side to dry. So now we're going to get started on the floor. This is the floor that is going to go in my book nook. What I'm going to be showing you soon here is just going to be like a little sample of how I made this particular floor, simply because it is kind of time consuming to do this section. So I do have this cardboard insert that we're going to put inside of the book nook. The reason I did this is because it's much easier to work on this insert than it would be to work inside the book nook with the box already made and all that. We're going to take your insert. You should have a cardboard piece that's already traced out. Granted, it's going to be a little bit bigger than you need it, but you can always trim that down. Just make sure that it fits inside of your book nook. So once that's all trimmed, what we're going to do is mix up a brown color. So for brown, essentially it's a dark orange color. So in order to make orange, we'll need to mix red and yellow. And once we mix the red and the yellow, we'll add a little bit of black to that mixture until you get the right color that you want. So if you want like a more redder toned brown, you'll want to put a little bit more red to that color. If you don't want that so much, maybe put in a little bit more yellow. Really, you can just mess around with the paint until you get a color that you like. If it's not exactly the same, that is fine. As you can tell on my example here, there are some sections of the floor that kind of look a little bit more faded or worn. If it's a different color, it gives it an old feel, which is what I was kind of going for anyway with this project. You can do whatever it is that you would like to do with the floor. So. Once we have mixed our paint, we will then paint our coffee stirrers. So that those are the really tiny, very thin, like popsicle stick things. And we're going to paint one side of our popsicle sticks in this color that we mixed up. And we'll do that with like a bunch of these, if not all of them. So once you have finished painting all of your coffee stirrers, we're going to then cut our coffee stirrers into little like floor planks. So I believe I cut mine about two inches long. 
And I'll do this with quite a few of my copiers, though not all of them, and you'll see why soon. I would suggest maybe doing like a good maybe 15 or something with that particular measurement. And then when you're done, you can come back. So in order to cut these, I did use an X-Acto knife. What I did with that is I kind of just marked off where I needed to cut and then used the X-Acto knife to like score where I wanted it to break. And then I kind of broke it a little bit. Though if you want like a more precise cut, I would say score one side and then turn it over, score the other side and then kind of break it. It like breaks weird if you don't do it that way. If you do have a sharp enough X-Acto knife, you can kind of like shave off any like uneven edges with that knife. Also, if you have a particularly like sturdy pair of scissors, you can also just use scissors to cut them too. Like, but that's only if you have like really strong like craft scissors. So now that you're done uh, cutting your two inch lengths of wood, what you're gonna do is paint your floor insert the same exact color as your floor. The reason for this is so that if you do have like any of the cardboard showing, it looks like the floor instead of cardboard. It makes it look a little bit better. I also suggest that you not necessarily paint the entire thing simply because if you're doing the same scene that I am doing, the back end will eventually turn into like a landscape scene essentially and i'll have a tree up in the background so it's like the floors are slowly transitioning into like a forest scene so i didn't paint the whole insert this color okay so now that we have that all painted and the paint has dried we can then start to glue our little planks onto our floor insert i used hot glue simply because it sets really fast but you can use a white glue like a school glue with this you can also use a wood glue if you have that as well doesn't really matter as long as it sticks so i put down my first plank of wood parallel with the edge of my insert then i'll take another plank of wood and instead of gluing it like right next to the previous plank i kind of glued it a little further up the floor insert and I did that about twice and once I had those down I then started the pattern up again so once you have your pattern established you then have to fill in the gaps so right now I'm trying to fill in the gaps towards the front of my insert so I took the little leavings of my previous cuttings when I was cutting up the two inch strips and I kind of glued one right up against that one section that had some wood missing. After that, I took my knife and I kind of trimmed off the rounded edge of my coffee stirs. With the other longer pieces, I kind of just measured how long of pieces I needed. I cut those out and then glued them in place. For the sections towards the back of the insert, you'll still want to continue with the two inch length pieces that you had cut out and then just kind of continue with those until you feel like it's done. When you are done with gluing that down, if you have some sections of your coffee stirs that haven't been painted or spots where you want to make it a little bit more worn, you can go in with your paint and start kind of dry brushing certain areas. So if I had any exposed wood, I went in with the original color and kind of painted that. Or if I wanted some more like worn areas, what I did was I took some black, but I didn't like load my brush with the black. I kind of took some black and then like on a napkin or something, I brushed off a lot of the black and then went in with that brush in certain sections and kind of just like messily brushed the black on and that gave it this really cool effect. So now that you're done with the painting of the floor and the putting it down, 
we're going to make it look as if moss is kind of springing through the floorboards. So with this, I kind of noted some sections of the floor that I felt needed some of that moss. I put like a dab of glue in that spot, put my moss down. I kind of patted it down just to get the glue to really stick onto the moss. Um, and then I let it dry. Granted, I used hot glue, so that was very quick for me. If you're using like school glue, white glue, any other type of glue, you might want to wait a little while. But once it's dried, you want to kind of shake off any of the excess or like brush off any of the excess. So just that one section you put glue on uh, has that moss coming through. The way you want to do this is by having like small little sections of moss towards the front of the floor and then a lot of moss towards the back just so that it kind of starts to look like grass and like the forest is really like encroaching in to the room that's kind of how i wanted my book nook to look you can do it however you want So when making knickknacks, you can make knickknacks really out of anything, but one of the things that we gave you that you can try and make knickknacks from is clay. So this is air dry clay, and you can use water if it's a little bit dry to kind of soften it up again. I kind of rolled my little ball around and then I decided how much I wanted to take off for my first knickknack, which is going to be a vase. So I took off a little bit, just big enough to kind of go on my bookshelf and kind of rolled it into a ball. So once I rolled it into a ball, I kind of flattened the bottom a bit just to give it like a nice flat surface to be able to stand up straight. Then I started to kind of shape it with my fingers. So I wanted the bottom of the vase to be a little bit rounded and then to have a very tall neck and a bit of a wide brim. So I started using my fingers in order to kind of bring the clay upwards and to keep the bottom rounded. So I use my fingers and then another tool I use was just the end of one of my brushes. So I had a thin, one of those thin brushes and then I kind of used that to help me shape my little vase. Once I got it more or less to the shape that I wanted, I decided to then start to make the lip of my vase and I used the end of my paintbrush here to make that hole. So I stuck the end of my paintbrush at the top where the mouth of the vase would be, not all the way down, just a little bit of the way, and then used the end of my paintbrush to kind of push the sides of the mouth of the vase open just to kind of give it that nice little lip that vases tend to have. If you start to see that your vase is starting to crack, you can use a little bit of water to kind of smooth out those little pieces. I saw here that the neck of the vase was not as long as I wanted it to be, so I used my fingers to continuously shape and prod this clay to make it look how I wanted it to look. So when I was done, I kind of just set it off to the side to let it dry. When it's dry, you can like paint it if you want to. If not, that's fine. You can just leave it in its natural color and that's good too. So one of the other knickknacks that I decided to make was a little like bird. This bird that I'm gonna make isn't going to be a very detailed bird at all. It's gonna be more like the vague shape of a bird. So I took a bit of clay. I made mine a little bit bigger just so that you can see what I'm doing. Rolled it into a ball and then like I did with the little vase, I flattened the bottom a little bit on my table and then I started to shape my bird. So a bird has kind of two distinctive shapes. I would say that you see usually like the head and the beak and then the body and then the little swoop of the tail, which usually sticks kind of up. So the first thing I did was to start making like the head and neck of my bird. So with that, I took my fingers and kind of pinched one side where the head was going to be. 
and did that until I was happy with it. Then I kind of started doing the same thing with the other end, though with that one, instead of having like more of a right angle, I guess, with the bottom, I kind of started swooping the tail up so that it was a rounded shape. And then the top I wanted to be kind of pointy. So as you can see, that's what I'm doing um, here with this particular bird. With the beak, what I did was I took my paintbrush and kind of bent the like the head down a little bit and then started to slowly point that section down to make it look more like a beak. Then I took the end of my paintbrush and I stuck it where the eye should be and then made little indentations where the wings would be on my little bird. It's just a very basic shape, which should be easy to do. Of course, you can do whatever it is that you like with this clay. Be as creative as you can be. So now we're going to start making our tree and our chair. If you're making a scene like mine, this will be a very useful section of the video because this is probably one of the hardest parts of this whole thing. So the first thing that you do is take your two foam blocks that you have and you're going to glue them together. I used hot glue for this. Again, you can use whatever works for you. So I glued the whole thing and then made sure that all the edges to my foam block were even and then just glued that right on top. I just pressed it together a little bit, took off any excess of the hot glue. This is a low temp hot glue gun, so I was able to do that with my fingers. If you're using a regular hot glue gun, don't do that because that will burn. In any case, once that's all glued, I will then cut this foam section in half. I'm using an X-Acto knife for this. If you have something better, go ahead and use that. So what I did is I just kind of eyeballed like the center of the project and then just sawed my blade through. Because the hot glue is a lot denser than the foam, your knife will have a harder time cutting through the pieces of hot glue that stick the two pieces of foam together. Then what you want to do, because these foam blocks here that I have, they're a little too short for the tree itself. So I'm going to then cut one of the halves in half again and glue that portion onto the top of the longer section that I have here. And again, I used a hot glue for that as well. As you can see, those two sections that I have will in fact be tall enough for my book nook. So now that that's all set, we can then start to sketch on our foam block what we're trying to carve out. In this case, it's a tree. So I drew an outline of a tree trunk as well as a couple of branches. If you mess up, that's okay because these black lines are going to be carved away anyway. This is just supposed to be a template for us to know where we should carve and where we shouldn't carve. When I was drawing the branches of my tree, I tried to remember that the branches themselves are smaller as they get closer to the top or to the sky and thicker as they are close closer to the trunk. So I kind of try to keep that in mind as I was sketching. So I have one side of this sculpture, I guess, traced out and then I'm going to try and start carving away. So the easiest sections to carve are like the sides where the trunk is. So that's where I started. If you're using an X-Acto knife like I am, there is a particular technique that you should be using with this particular foam so that it doesn't like start like bubbling off you kind of want thin like sheets of it coming off so you do want to start off with like a, a brand new blade and then use a sawing motion when you're cutting 
That way it comes off in little sheets instead of like bubbling away as this stuff is want to do. So once I started getting to the top, what I started to do was to start carving my branches. Because I haven't really drawn out any of the other sides, what I want to do is just to kind of mark off and start to round those sections that I had. So I just kind of cut out little bits here and there, kind of traced my lines with my knife to cut out little sections. If it didn't get all the way through, that's perfectly fine because on each of the sides, we're going to try and carve off different sections. This is very hard to explain, but hopefully the video is clear so that you can see what exactly I'm doing. As you can see, you know, I'm just carving off little pieces. I'm not going all the way to the other side. This is just to help me see it more in three dimensions instead of just as a 2D, you know, drawing on this foam block. So when it comes to like the where the trunk is, I kind of am carving away closer to like the middle of the trunk to give it that like shape of a tree trunk where it's like thicker by the roots and thicker by the branches. And I just kind of took away little pieces at a time as I was going. You can always carve more, but you can't like put stuff back. In this case, you kind of can if you mess up, you can take a little bit of hot glue and like glue it back and then start carving again. But in general, you want to take it down little by little. You don't want to do it like do big carving out sections. So at this point, I started to trace out my tree from a different side. As you can see, I'm trying to make the trunk, but also if you are ending one of your branches at a side, you kind of want to draw that as a circle because branches in a cross cut are round. So I just kind of drew a couple of circles and made a place where I maybe wanted a branch and had that as my template for carving. So when you're carving, you want to take away all of the negative space. So all the space that you want to be empty, you want to take all that foam in those sections away. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to round out my trunk. I'm trying to take away foam that's in the places where there's supposed to be air. And you just kind of keep taking little by little until you get the look that you want. So when I would get to the other sides of this block, I would kind of trace out where I wanted branches on that side and then carving those out as well. So you carve the chair in a very similar fashion that you carve the tree, though this is a much easier thing to carve because it's going to be a bean bag. Um, you can carve whatever chair you want. What I did was I drew out what the shape of my bean bag was going to be, more or less, and then I started to cut off big chunks and then started to carve around to make sure that I had a rounded shape. So in order to furnish the chair, what I'm going to do is take one of those pieces of cloth that I gave you and we are going to kind of pin them in place. How we pin them in place is with a bit of the wire. I'm going to like bend them, make like a little staple, and then I'm going to staple the piece of cloth to the bottom. So my first pinned piece, I just kind of made sure I had like the barest amount pinned to the bottom, and then I started to kind of fold and pleat 
the cloth around my shape in order for it to hug it and to kind of make it look like a couch or something like that and then continue to pin sections into to the bottom. Now we're going to make the bookcase. So a lot like how we made the floor, we're going to make up a brown color. So I took a little bit of yellow, a lot of red, and a little bit of black, mixed it together, and I came up with this brown color. Then we're just going to paint all of our popsicle sticks that we have this color. Depending on the kit that you have, you might have some like large popsicle sticks, or you might have these like regular size popsicle sticks. If you have the larger ones, then the thickness of your bookcase is going to be one large popsicle stick or two of these regular ones. Okay, so now we're going to glue our popsicle sticks onto our piece of cardstock. This is what I mentioned before about it being, depending on the size of your popsicle sticks, you'll want either, them either to be two together or just one. I have these small ones here, so I'm using two. And this is just for like the sides of the bookcase and the top and the bottom. So that's how wide those little sections will be. I'm going to glue two of the popsicle sticks together, but when I cut it out, I'm going to give ample room on either side. <music> So remember that with these popsicle sticks, you'll want to cut off the rounded edges. You can do this with an X-Acto knife, like how we did with the floor, or you can use like a heavy duty craft scissors to like cut the popsicle sticks. Depends on, on what you have and what you want to do. So I used hot glue to glue these popsicle sticks onto the cardstock. You can use whatever. I used the hot glue because it was quick to dry. So when I was gluing these on, I just kind of glued them side by side. Depending on how tall you want to make your bookshelf, you can like stagger them like how we did with the floor. But because I'm making like a sample bookcase in this case, I'm just going to glue them side by side. It just means I'll have a shorter bookcase. So if you notice that um, your popsicle sticks are kind of crooked and then you've got some space in between the two popsicle sticks, you can just take some black and then just kind of paint that little section black to make it look like a little older and also like a shadow. Now you do that um, twice. So you'll have two of these sections. Um, this particular sections are, are going to be the two sides of our bookshelf. So with my bookshelf now, I'm going to decide how wide the bookshelf is going to be. So I took my popsicle sticks and just checked to see how wide I can make it with the popsicle sticks that I had. Mine was five popsicle sticks wide. And those five popsicle sticks were the same width as these other smaller popsicle sticks that are going to be the top and bottom that I was able to cut in half. So what I did with this is again I took my piece of cardstock and I glued them all in a line together. And again I made sure that this back panel of the bookshelf had ample cardstock around it. And then I did the same thing with the popsicle sticks that are going to go on the top and the bottom of my bookshelf. So 
So each of these sections of popsicle sticks are only one-sided. By that I mean only one side has the popsicle sticks, which is fine, but we do then may have to make sure that the side with the popsicle stick is always going to be showing from the front. So this uh, section of popsicle stick that I have here is going to be the side that's the furthest back on the bookshelf. So I'll be gluing it so that the two popsicle sticks are kind of touching. So I'll be gluing that corner with hot glue and I'll be trimming off a little bit of that excess on the side of the popsicle stick that's longest. So once I trim off that excess, I'm going to then glue that corner down and then I'm going to hold on to it so that it sets. After that, I'm going to then take the white cardstock that is attached to the back panel of the bookshelf and fold it upwards and glue it to the back of the side panel of the bookshelf. Now I'm going to trim off any excess cardstock on that side of the bookshelf. So now we're going to be gluing the other side panel of the bookshelf. This time, instead of the popsicle stick side facing the inside, it's going to be facing the outside because this side panel will be the closest to the viewer of the book nook. So what I did here was I trimmed off the excess on the back panel of the bookshelf and then I folded that little piece of extra cardstock on the side panel that I'm gluing on to make a little like ledge. I'm going to then glue that little back ledge there to the back of the back panel. So now I'm going to be gluing the top panel of my bookshelf on. For this section, the wood part is going to be like on top of the bookshelf. I trimmed off both the long sides of this section flush to the popsicle sticks and I kind of folded the short sections of the cardstock down. I also trimmed a bit of the cardstock that's already on my bookshelf form to make separate flaps. So I glued one of the flaps on the top edge of this bookshelf down to the inside of the bookshelf, but that was because that side had cardstock on it. So I glued it with the cardstock on the inside, and then the other side of that cardstock section, I glued that section to the outside of the other side of the bookshelf. And then I had some extra flaps, and then I glued those down or trimmed them off.
and then you do the same thing with the bottom side though this time the popsicle sticks will be kind of facing the inside of the bookshelf <laughs> To make the shelf, what I did was I cut a popsicle stick to size to fit the inside of my bookshelf. If you need two popsicle sticks to make a shelf, what you can do is, like we did with the other sides of the bookshelf, is just use the cardstock as a backing to kind of have them fit together. And then just cut off all the excess of cardstock from the outside of that section. And then just glue the sides of your bookshelf and then just stick it where you want it and then hold it to make sure that it stays that way and then you have a bookshelf so now that you're done with that um, you want to paint all these white sections brown just so that the white cardstock doesn't show through on your project here so i just mixed up a new brown color as close to the original brown color as i could and then I just started painting it all over. So now I'm going to show you how to make little tiny books. So with this, we'll want to take our cardboard. I'm using the corrugated cardboard here, but I did give you some of that like very thin chipboard as well, and this works better with that, I found, than with this corrugated stuff. But the process is still the same. So what I do is measure how big I want my book. It didn't really have to be exact, so I kind of just cut off a piece that I found to be acceptable. And then what I did was I kind of bent it in a little bit on one side and then maybe like a fourth of an inch, maybe a little bit less than that, I made another fold as well. Essentially it makes this little like C shape with the cardboard and that small little bit, that little like fourth inch is like the spine of the book. So what I'm doing here is just trimming any areas that are kind of uneven on like this book cover essentially. Once I do that, I'm going to take a small piece of the white foam. You do want it to be long enough to wrap around the entire open edge of this book cover essentially, but you don't want it to be thicker than the spine. So once you've cut out that little white piece, that essentially is going to be the pages of the book. So I'm going to take some glue and I'm going to kind of run the glue gun all around the top edge of my book cover and I'm going to then stick my little piece of foam right up against the spine and then close the covers of the book onto that white piece and then hold it there for it to dry. I'm using hot glue. I don't know if you can use any other glue with this but you can try. I use hot glue because it sets quickly. So after that sets, I put glue down on the next section, as you can see here, and I folded down the white foam so that the glue, you know, hit the white foam and holds it in place. And then I wrapped it around again after that to get like the bottom section of that book. So once you have all of your little books all made, you'll want to paint the book white. The reason for this is because the cardboard, as it's a brown, you won't get very nice bright colors that show through that. So if you paint it white and then go in with your brighter colors, 
the colors shine better. The red isn't as muddy as if it was if you were to paint on just the brown cardboard. That's what I'm doing here is I'm just painting it all white and then once I'm done painting everything white, I'll then start painting all my books, all the different colors that I want it to be. So once I've painted the books the colors that I want them, I'm going to start making the little details on the book. So I wanted to make my books look a little bit like old-fashioned, and if you see old-fashioned books, sometimes they have the, these little like gilded lines on the spine. So I kind of was doing that with some paint, and instead of like gilding, because I don't have any gold paint, I just used some black and white to make those little lines with my thin brush and as you can see that is how my lines turned out and I kind of did that with all of my books I also kind of made little squiggles to make it look like the title is written on the side of the book I have zero control over that tiny of movement so I couldn't write down an actual book title but if you do that would be even better after I've painted all of my books and put little details on, I can then put them on my bookshelf. So I essentially kind of put them in my bookshelf and arrange them the way that I wanted them to look. And once I found a good arrangement, I then took some glue and I secured them onto my bookshelf. So I just took a little bit of hot glue and stuck it in my bookshelf. If I had like a pile of books that were glued together, I would glue those together first and then glue that whole little pile onto my bookshelf. So now that we are finished doing all the small things, it's time to put everything together. So in order to put this together, the first thing I do is cut out a section of panel L on my box in order to be able to access the back of the back panel that we're going to be putting in. So what I did first was trace section A to make sure that I don't cut past that line when I'm cutting out my sections out of L. I decided to cut a pretty big section that is helpful for when you are gluing down your back panel. So now in order to secure the back panel onto our box, what I'm going to do is glue on some strips of cardstock onto the edges of this back panel. So I just kind of took some scrap cardstock that I had, cut it into a couple of strips, folded them in half, and then glued one side of that half onto my background here. So now that we're done with gluing that, we are now going to insert our back panel into our box. So what I did was I pushed that back panel all the way back and then through that hole that I made on the back, I'm able to line up this back panel and make sure it's straight. Then we're going to glue down the extra flap onto the sides of our box. So 
So now we're going to get started with the LED lights. You can undo the little package that it's in. It already comes with batteries. There might be a little like plastic thing that you'll have to pull, but just switch the little light to make sure that it's working for you. And then we can get started with putting it all together. In order to make the string of lights for the moon, I have to first make the frame in which I will be wrapping the LED lights on. So I took a length of wire and I wrapped it around so that it was a circle about as big as the moon was. And then I left that to the side when I was done. So in order to control like the big old long wire that the LED lights are in, I folded the LED wire in half and then twisted it in order to keep it locked together. I'll use that shorter length to do the project. After that, I marked off on flap A of the box um, where I wanted to put my ring of lights. Okay, so while you're measuring out where you're gonna put your moon frame, you also wanna mark down where you're gonna place the battery pack. I just kind of placed it a little bit further down and then just made sure that I had enough give to where I was going to start wrapping just so that it wouldn't like pull on where the battery pack is. So after I marked where I wanted my little moon piece to go, I took another small length of wire and then I made like little feet for the frame for the moon. So I kind of just took the little piece of wire, bent it in half, twisted one section of it together and then attached that section to that moon frame that I had. And then I bent one end up a little bit so that it was like at a more or less 90 degree angle so that I can glue that section down to the box. And then I made a second one of those. So now you're going to wrap the LED lights onto your wire frame. You do want to give a little bit of room, about maybe like six or so inches, and then you want to start wrapping the wire around your frame. And you can wrap this however way you want, just as long as there is some light that is going to be um, across the circle so that it looks like the moon. So now we're going to glue the battery pack on where we marked it. I decided to glue this back side, that way you still have access to the batteries on the inside. So you'll be able to change the batteries when the batteries run out. So you just place it there and then let it set. After that, we are going to place the little feet of the moon frame. For the moon frame, what I did was I put a glob of hot glue onto the cardboard where I marked it, and then I put the little feet down and then after that, I put a piece of cardboard over the foot just so that the wire would stay where it's supposed to stay. And then I did the same exact thing on the other side as well. Once that is finished, you can then start to thread your LED lights through to the front of the project. I had this little corner that was free and that's where I started threading my piece. If not, if you don't have that, you can probably cut out a very small piece and you can do it that way as well. So once you are finished with that back panel, you can start inserting all of your other pieces. So for my piece here, I'm going to put in the wall. So for this, I had to trim off about a fourth of an inch off the top. And then once I got it to fit fully in there, I put it in and then trace the edge of the cardboard that was sticking out and then trim that off as well. When I was done trimming, I was able to hot glue the back and press it down. I was making sure that um, I was putting enough pressure on there so that it would adhere well to the side of the box. Repeat these steps with the other wall and with the floor as well. 
So for this section, I suggest that you do this before you decide to glue in your tree. I did not do this in here and it was very difficult for me to do. So learn from my mistakes and do this part before you glue the tree down into your book nook. So what we're going to do is make some like ivy branches and make it look as if it's coming off the tree and onto the walls of our book nook. What I did first was to take a long piece of wire and I folded it in half a couple of times in order to make this little like loop at the bottom. That loop is going to hook onto a little section of our tree. So once I folded it in half a few times, I started to then cut towards the top of it, not where your loop is, but you want to cut any extra loops from each other. And then you'll start to twist a stem and then with all the wires in it, and then you will separate each of the stems and then twist them again and then put them together and then twist those in order to make this kind of like net like structure that kind of looks like the ivy is coming in and out from each other. So now I'm going to make the little hook in order to hook the loop at the end of my ivy to my tree. So I just did it pretty much the same way that I made the little feet for the moon frame and then had a couple of free ends in order for me to stick those ends into the styrofoam of the tree. If you have branches that are kind of either small enough or if you make your loop wide enough, you can kind of just put the loop of your ivy stem onto that branch and you can then glue it down with some hot glue or something similar. So at this point is probably when you want to glue down your tree if you haven't done that already because we're going to be wrapping the LED wire around our tree and our ivy and so that the tree will need to be in its like permanent spot and then you just want to wrap the wire around your ivy however you like just so that the ivy has like this pretty light going through it. So once you have all the LED wire already wrapped onto your ivy, what we're going to do is we're going to set it up where we want it to stay. So I took some pliers and I kind of bent the ivy stems around so that it would stay up against the walls. Then I took some hot glue and just glued some of those points down and then put some moss in there just to kind of hold it all in place since I used the hot glue. And then of course I took one end of the ivy stems and kind of made it go over my bookcase so that it looked nice. After I kind of have everything then set in its permanent spot, I then started to decorate it with moss and with the little miniature leaves. I used hot glue and Elmer's glue for this. You could use whatever you like. It is time to glue in all of our other little pieces into our book nook. The first thing I did was to glue in this tree. The tree, this is what it looks like carved, but it will be painted if you want it to not be white. So I just put some hot glue at the bottom and then put it where I want it to be. Same thing with the bookcase and the chair, as well as any of the boulders and moss and all that sort of stuff. You can just kind of put some glue down and stick it where you want it. For the moss and for the leaves, I found that the best glue for that was just regular white Elmer's glue. Um, so I just put some Elmer's glue down, took a brush, brushed it around a little bit, 
and then just kind of sprinkled the leaves down or the moss down and then kind of pressed down on it just to make sure that it was nicely glued on. So when you're done setting all of this up, you can then start to decorate the inside however you like. You can glue down all your little knickknacks, your books, your moss leaves, you know, whatever. One thing that I did not show here that you should probably do is to decorate the outside. With my original example, I just painted the outside a neutral color. You can do whatever you'd like. You can paint designs on the outside. You can take some scrapbook paper if you have that lying around and wrap your book nook in that. Essentially make it your own. Now this is what your complete book nook should look like, at least if you decide to follow my template. You can do, of course, your book nook to look however you like. I hope you guys had fun with this project. Send us any pictures you'd like, either through Facebook and Instagram, or you could email it to the teen department if you'd like. I will have all that information down in the description. If you are interested, you can sign up also for the next Try Your Hand, which will be a crochet bookmark. All right. I hope you guys had fun with this project and we'll see you next time.